Okay. Yeah. Right then. Good morning, friends. And here on this lovely sunny day, we are going to hear Maggie Mason, who is titled her talk today, Walking in Hope, a short talk about the 2022 Northern Cross pilgrimage to Lindisfarne, Northampton, Northumbria, as featured in the Easter Sunday Song of Praise. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming along to listen to me. I did have a bit of a subtitle underneath that because it's not just about that. It's really about the climate and ecological emergency and whether we can have any hope anymore. So it's very much walk, walking in hope question mark. So I'm going to be sharing screen and I hope that will work. And um, I've got some PowerPoint slides. and I'll try not to take up all the time so there's not enough room for discussion. And I will be, if it works, showing a, a four minute clip from the um, Songs of Praise um, thing that was done on Easter Sunday this year. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm not very proud of it. It's got me in it talking in a funny voice, which I don't like, and, and selecting the things I didn't want them to select rather than the things that I was thought I was trying to talk about. But I thought it was important to put it on anyway. So here we go. Let's go from the top, see if you can make it work. So share. That should come up and then we're going to go for that and we're going to go from the beginning. Right, there we go. Can you all see that? So walking in hope question mark, is it still possible? And I mean that in the light of where we are now, uh, the war, uh, uh, climate and ecological emergency, et cetera, et cetera. So life as a pilgrimage is a bit of a, um, a cliche really, isn't it? But for me personally, it has been like that really. Um, and if you're gonna do a pilgrimage, you need to know where you're going and we need to look at what we're learning and do we need hope to go on a pilgrimage and what can that hope be founded on and that's basically what I'm trying to look at today so my actual real physical pilgrimages I did twice I did um, about 300 miles of the Camino de Santiago uh, and then twice I did something called student cross and then lots of times I've done northern cross which is what I'm mainly going to be talking about today. Um, so do you need a destination? Well, this was my first pilgrimage, going to Santiago to Compostela. I mean, really, pilgrimages, destinations for pilgrimage are kind of just something you have to have. But really, did we really want to go to a place where there's a huge gold shrine supposedly holding a relic of, the, um, of James the Apostle um, and full of ornate stuff? It didn't really matter because it's the journey that matters. So I set off in 1974 um, to walk 300 miles of the Camino. Um, my sister had done it before and uh, we gathered up some other people that we knew to go along. And it was being led actually by a, a very interesting Catholic priest who was really, a, um, he lived in Africa most of the time and he was a bit of a, was a, bit of a, a rebel himself. But this was Franco Spain. So you can see from the pictures, you know, um, mostly black and white pictures as well. We were crossing rivers where there were no bridges and there weren't that many roads as we sort of wandered across the plains. And um, actually none of us spoke any Spanish at all until we found this nice young man um, at the bottom here who was just wandering around and he spoke Spanish. So he came with us as an interpreter. And there were no signposts, uh, no nice shells like there are later on. Um, and hardly any toilets at all. And most of them were sort of squatter types. And you went out in the fields sometimes. And mostly you got to a branch in the road or the path, I should say. And there'd be somebody standing there leaning on a rake. Um, and uh, you'd say, Camino de Santiago in Iti Arriba, Arriba. And that's all, that's how we found our way, basically. Oh, well, hardly any maps. So that was 1974. And it was um, an amazing experience. Um, took us about three weeks. Um, and I then went on, a sec I, it's not the next consequentially in my life, um, but I will move on to the second Camino, which was in 2013. And uh, my husband and I went by bike and uh, there were hostels 
um, loos, Wi-Fi, and uh, quite a lot of roads. And it was, again, a wonderful experience. Um, not quite what we expected, but very different and, and great. This one of us sitting together on a bench with our, my feet in a, in a plastic bowl was particularly lovely because this thing about washing our feet in a bowl at the end of a pilgrimage is something that has, has carried on into Northern Cross. And um, we, uh, we found that place where we had slept in a piggery in a high village called Rabanal, and they'd actually turned it into a pilgrim hostel now. And the piece of plank which we're sitting on there was on the other side. And I've got a photograph of us all sitting along that side um, with our, because we carried plastic bags, uh, plastic bowls to wash our feet because there was no bathrooms or anything. And uh, in this place, they've kept that tradition alive and they had a pile of plastic bowls to wash your feet. And, um, and, and, the, and the big log had been moved from one side to the other, um, which, was, which was lovely. So that was in 2013. Um, but my second, the consecutive, um, straight after my 1974 Camino, um, I went on something called Student Cross, which goes to Walsingham. It's now called Pilgrim Cross. So um, I walked it in 1975 and 76. So immediately after the year after the, um, after the Camino. And that was because some people who were with us on the Camino had done this and they recommended it. But what of is of interest to me is that it started in 1948 as a pilgrimage of present penance and prayer. And it was really in penance for the, and horror for what had happened in the Second World War. So it was, um, you see the picture of them then back in 1948. Uh, it was a strong community, um, quite pacifist, a little bit communist, uh, very Roman Catholic. So it had formal Holy Week and Easter liturgies. And the destination was a shrine devoted to Mary. So again, you know, was that the kind of, um, is, does, it, does the destination matter or is it this the journey? But what I did get from that was this lovely idea of living the dream because living together in community and walking in pilgrimage is just amazing. And live the dream was what a lovely lady I met on that said to me. And then I ended up finding myself behind, beside a church, beside her in a church in Sheffield many years later. And she became a big part of my life. And we lived in a sort of, um, uh, well, supportive community, um, all in our own houses for a while with, 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 um, Christine, who I met on the uh, Student Cross 1976. But um, the destinations did matter. And some of the people who did Student Cross and had also done the Camino with me uh, decided on an alternative destination, which was Lindisfarne, Holy Island in Northumbria, um, which is lovely on a nice day. Um, <laughs> but that's where they decided to start going to. So in 1976, they started the first one walking from Penrith to Lindisfarne while I was on the other, uh, the last of my student crosses. And uh, if you can see the, the, the guy sitting in the orange on top of the cross, that's just because it was a comfortable place to sit. That's my late husband. Um, and there he is again, there standing by the church, we, by the cross. We made this cross in our garage. Um, and as a contrast to student cross, Northern Cross only had two rules. One was it, that it was ecumenical, and the second was that there weren't any other rules. And it was um, delightfully um, liberal for the time. We thought we were terribly rebellious um, because they were, again, mainly uh, Catholic postgraduate students or young professionals. And um, we, we managed to drag along some Catholic chaplains to, to, to do some Catholic services or nobody would want to go. And then we had a service in the Anglican church on, on uh, Lindisfarne. And we all loved going to communion to the wrong vicar. You know, uh, we were, thought we were terribly rebellious. And when there was a woman vicar, that was even better. And um, it started off quite liberal and good fun. Um, so in 1977, um, it expanded and then there were two legs and I went along and we did a play in the host churches, which somebody wrote because it, it was all democratic and you just voted for leaders each time somebody wrote a play and the first lines in the first play on a, um, having just learnt our part on the Saturday in the next Sunday, wandering across Northumberland was me saying, I don't give a damn what Jesus says with great um, emphasis, which is what I was told to do. Um, but it was 
really interesting. We sang in the pubs. Um, as I say, it was liturgically rebellious. Um, we did a lot in the pubs. That's me at the back. I was six months pregnant, um, but it was a remarkable experience. And we met really interesting people and explored ideas. Um, we weren't all that ecumenical because, you know, they wouldn't have really known what to do if, if they got a Baptist, to be honest. Um, but there we go. Um, so it's a meditation on history to carry a cross along beside Hadrian's Hall, thinking that you're carrying a Roman um, instrument of torture along beside the own, old Hadrian's Wall. Um, I'm showing you all pictures in the sunshine, but it didn't always, obviously. And it's carried on, you see, since 1977 to now with only a few breaks. And a lot of what I'm going to talk to about you about is 2022, but um, these are pictures from before. Um, on this occasion, uh, yes, carrying the cross makes you think, this dear gentleman here is called Stefan and he's a Quaker from Sheffield. And he was on the 22 walk again this year, uh, though that was quite a long time ago. On that occasion, that route was doing St Cuthbert's leg, I think, which has uh, got some quite flat bits in it. Um, the little bits across the bottom, by the way, I'm, I'm meaning those to represent footprints. I hope you, you like my arty design there. Um, so, and then when we could, when Easter used to coincide with the school holidays, which it doesn't always do now, we used to get quite a lot of young people. Um, and this is two legs coming together. You can see two crosses. And in the, the, the different, by now, at times there've been five or even six legs all joining together um, at the end. And so they converge on this one road as they go down to the sands. And there's a lot of fun when everybody gets together. Um, and they all blow whistles, which is really lovely. Um, and then crossing the sands on Good Friday. Um, on this year that this photograph's come from, clearly one of the legs, as we call them, um, was traveling on their own, whereas sometimes we would all gather together and come over across. It's the question of how you manage the traffic on the other side. Um, but I want to tell you something about this, because you see, when we first started, it's about leadership. What have I learned? A lot about leadership, a lot about um, faith and worship. Because if you go right back to the beginning, to the, the Camino that we did in 1974, that was led by a priest. He did all the liturgy and said prayers and it was a bit rebellious and they were quite happy to, you know, say mass not wearing the right things and doing things in the wrong places a bit on the liberal wing. But um, that was people quite content to do it that way. Um, Student Cross was a more participatory and they had a thing whereby um, when you stop for a rest, you one person would lead a meditation or a thought that they'd been thinking about as they walked along. So it, it was for me perhaps a beginning towards um, a Quaker way of doing things. Um, there, was, there was thoughtfulness, there was meditation and people were free to just to say what they want. Um, and Northern Cross carried that idea forward, um, what they call the stations, um, always followed by a cup of tea and a biscuit from a car which sort of follows you behind, comes along and meets you at meeting spots. Um, but again, there's a little handbook, um, a, a leg guide, which is written for each year, um, and it contains a selection of thoughts, poems, etc. And then there's a songbook which collection, has a, a series of, of thoughts, uh, of songs, and there is there is involvement in what thoughts and prayers and words you put into it and you either um choose choose a prayer from there if you're put a bit nervous but you want to take a, a turn at, at giving ministry really um but also people just speak off the cuff um so it's a very participatory very egalitarian um and of course lots and lots of work making porridge in the morning and washing up and loading things into car and that's all totally um done share you, you share all of that so it's a lovely experience of, of pilgrimage. Um, so this was 2018, Easter Sunday. Uh, it was a kind of a high point for me, really. Um, 
we'd only had one year when we hadn't walked and that was the year of um, foot and mouth. Um, and 2018 was great, it was sunny. Um, the young lady carrying the cross there is my eldest granddaughter. She'd come along towards the end. Um, we were all full of, of joy and, and Easter excitement. Um, but then 2019, I, I, my husband died just before I was going to go. They came actually to his, his funeral on their way back, um, a lot of the pilgrims. And then 2020 and 2021, we couldn't walk because of COVID. So 2022 has been a very different experience and um, an interesting one, partly due to the intervention of Songs of Praise who told us they wanted to film us. Um, so where were we in 2022? I mean, for me, Northern Cross is a reflection on the last week of Jesus's life and reflections on tour and torture and oppression. They've always been an element of that because it goes back to the origins in Student Cross and World War II. And there's always been, as you walk along, you could imagine you're carrying the cross, you're thinking it's really, really visceral because you're doing something physical and it doesn't need any words and you're just experiencing it. Um, and yeah, you, 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 you've been thinking about, you know, things happening in Syria, things happening here, things happening there. But in 2022, I found it really, really shocking to be walking it as Russia invaded Ukraine, to be a war in Europe again. Shocking. Um, and uh, weirdly, we did the Holy Owl in filming on the 13th of March because um, Songs of Praise wanted us to do a fake Northern Cross first so they could film it, so they could be shown. So we went up and we did the crossing and we did the pretending Easter Sunday with them, which appears on the film. Um, and then we went back to do the real thing <laughs> actually the week before Easter as we should do um, and so it was just really starting when we did the fake Northern Cross um, but we, it was really embedded when we were the war was really embedded when we were walking the real Northern Cross and also the whole leg got Covid my my group was walking from Lanark and uh, I turned up a bit late because I'd done an Extinction Rebellion event on the on the Saturday so I'd caught Covid from somebody in London but dear Stefan, he turned up with COVID and slowly everybody went down with it. And they just about managed to get themselves to Holy Island, across the sands, get the cross to the other side onto Holy Island. And then they packed everything back in the car and went home because they had got COVID and didn't want to bring it to the second leg of Northern Cross, which then was one coming from Carlisle again. Um, so it was really strange because we didn't actually have the proper celebration, which kind of fitted with the fact that where was the joy when the world is where we are. Um, so a very thoughtful, very thoughtful process. So I'm now going to stop sharing this one, end this slideshow, um, try and stop sharing. Let me just get that up big. Um, why won't it show me everything? Because uh, I want to go in and show you a little bit of a film. Uh, okay, S uh, stop sharing and then start sharing again. And this time this should work. Let's get it back to the beginning. Right.
hello how are we doing i can't hear anything oh sorry no i, I can't hear anything either oh, I no. can't. I, sorry have you not been able to hear from the start no 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 oh, nothing. no that's awful you should have said thank you so much for saying but we, um, we, I, I i thought that you were pausing to get it up do you know what i mean did <laughs> you see anything no just you yourself no no nothing we got the microsoft a blank the blue the screen of we'll, death we'll forget that then um and we will stop that okay right thank you for telling me i wish you told me earlier but at least you saw some pictures so that's fine because what was going to come up next was me uh saying stuff and it's probably actually providential because I didn't like what they filmed about what I said they ambushed me talking about my late husband and um I ended up to, and that's the only bit they showed they didn't say anything I said about Ukraine about um anything important <laughs> really but that's just typical isn't it so I will go back to sharing the actual uh, presentation okay because we carry on now um that should work. No, I don't want to go from the beginning. I want to go from current slide. No, I just nip through. I'll just nip through. Okay, is that all right? I'll just nip through all of this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So we just flash through all of these things and we'll get to where I was. Okay. So where are joy and hope in 2022? Um, this is deliberately an elephant in the room. Because the elephant in the room here is that, um, well, one of the elephants in the room is that this is kind of a bit of a, not exactly a middle class, but this is, this is a luxury to be able to be in a situation of worrying about joy and hope in 2022, because there's plenty of pe people and all they're trying to hope for really is food on their plate, feeding the family um, and so on, sort of a bit high up. Maslow's level of um, hierarchy of needs or whatever. But it is something that troubles me and I suspect that it troubles quite a lot of us. Um, you know, we can find hope in nature sometimes. We uh, can get involved in the, appreciating the now. Um, some of us could do simple actions. This is my friends in Kendall, um, some of whom are, are friends, some uh, are Quakers and some who are not, mostly are not, I think. But then in 2017, you see, we wrote on another world is possible. That felt more true in 2017. Um, 2022, nonviolent direct action. People will be um, taking extreme action with just sleep, just stop oil. I've got a friend who's in remand in prison at the moment. Um, not something I personally have chosen to do, though I did get did get arrested once um, back in October 2019 for something much milder. Um, and when we talk to these these friends of ours um, and we're alongside people like this, I personally feel that I need to know where my hope is coming from and what it's based on, and to explore that with people who who perhaps may. Um, agree with me to some extent. And the other elephant in the room that comes in is that what you would have seen if you'd seen the bit of the film with, with me talking is that a little hint to the fact that a lot of my hope comes from my faith. And some of it, which is not really very examined. So for example, um, Songs of Praise really wanted to find out what we thought about simple Christian truths in inverted commas that most of their people would be looking at. So yeah, I tried to talk about the resurrection, what Christians call the resurrection. And none of my friends in Extinction Rebellion or very, very few would be interested in that being the source of my, our hope. And if I was to mention it, if you're not careful, you're seen as a, you could be seen as a sort of right wing, right wing US, um, um, evangelical who just thinks that Jesus is going to come down and uh, solve everything and give us a new earth and we don't need to do anything and it'll all be great and you know getting covered carried up into the rapture and as you will know we're not in that place but I do realize when I carry the cross at Easter and go and commit myself to do that I'm saying something that's very very deep to me 
which I'm very interested in exploring. So what I did next while trying to prepare this, and it's been really good for me as an experience, um, I did two things. I went to a, an old fashioned concordance in the back of an old fashioned paper Bible. And I also looked at online to look at the world hope and where hope was coming from and the different ways it was used. And I also went into Quaker faith and practice. And um, there weren't as many um, links that came up on my online search, but these ones I thought were interesting to consider. Um, so on the one hand, with John Roundtree in 1905, um, he's talking about adventuring in hope, which is we were having a little conversation about with, with, with Ray and Patsy when we first started off about life being an adventure. Um, and in the spirit and strength of our great comrade of Galilee. Now that brings me to tears just to say that, because that is how I feel Northern Cross makes me feel. You're walking, carrying the cross and you are walking in some way, thinking about meditating on and in, in the presence of our great comrade of Galilee. Um, and this uh, other one is from Marsden Monthly Meeting concerning John Bright. But again, towards the end, his aim was not popularity or party triumph, but the hope of advancing the cause of truth and right so far as he saw it. And, and, I, and I think that's what those of us who are trying to work for, move forward in some sort of combating um, or doing something about creating a better world or helping to do so. Uh, and again, at the bottom, I found it tremendously comforting to see this. All thoughtful men and women are torn at heart by the present situation, because I think that's a beautiful description about how a lot of us, how a lot of us feel. Um, but then the other thing that's been happening to me recently, and all these things come together sometimes, don't they? Just before that, I'd gone on a weekend at um, Glenthorne, the Quaker um, meeting centre in, in Cumbria, for a, a weekend with Rupert Reed, who, who was brought up a Quaker, I believe, though he has Buddhist side of things. I mean, does anybody know of Rupert Reed and, and, and know of his writings? Um, he writes that this... He's a, he was an Extinction Rebellion spokesman and he was one of the early people with Extinction Rebellion, but he, um, he, he's sort of pulled a bit back from Extinction Rebellion and he's looking for, if you like, the moderate wing um, and way of bringing people forward to accept things. But he has come to the conclusion that really this civilization is finished. Um, he's not talking about the extinction of humanity, but he says, he's a philosopher, by the way. Um, but if, if civilization is finished, um, and I think the Ukraine war has hastened the advent of multi bread basket failure and, and issues that are going to, to strike, um, that where is there hope, even a very slight one? And these three pictures um, are to illustrate three of the things that he says. Um, in a whole weekend, he obviously said a lot more. But he says, if the civilization is finished, it's either going to end like a dodo or and be completely extinct, or there'll be some sort of civilization that arises from the ashes like a phoenix. Or possibly a butterfly emerging from a pupae from a chrysalis. And however, what he means by that is an intentional, deep, radical, collaborative adaptation of civilization, equal, democratic, just, all the things that I'm sure we would want to see. And that this could happen before we end up in a, a, an extinction event. And it seems to me that while there's the very smallest possibility of this, being who and what we are, it's inherent in our nature to strive for that. Um, he says we could do it intentionally because we thought it might work or we could do it just because it's who we are. It's inherent in what we are and who we are. And um, so one of the things I tried to say to, uh, to, to uh, Songs of Praise, but <laughs> he didn't put it in, surprising. Um, 
about that if we're walking in the light of Christ, it should be very clear um, how we do that. But also that all humanity has some sort of light. I, I didn't want to fall into what they were trying to make me say, that if we all follow Jesus, everything would be fine. Um, and in fact, the point I was coming to, over a while, and, and Rupert Reed fed into it, and then somebody else I'm going to tell you about soon fed into it too. But this idea that maybe, maybe that's all that matters, not the outcome, but the honest attempt and the relationships we build as we travel along. Um, and I've been thinking that for a while and Rupert Reed really made me feel a clarity of thought on that, that I don't need to worry about outcomes. All I need to do is understand and open my mind as much as I can and then just be who I am. Um, as Naomi Klein says, we're not defending nature, we're nature defending itself. We are inherent in part of the response. Rupert Reed says, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase a bit because I can't remember his exact words, that things are unbelievably bad, but that it is also divinely perfect. And for me, with the intellectual and spiritual sort of baggage that I've collected along the way, um, that makes sense. I find it very hard to explain to anybody else um, because it's somebody else, it's, it's our own journey, isn't it? To see whether that's okay. Um, and so I want to tell you about, one of the things about pilgrimage is that you meet and talk to really interesting people as well as hopefully getting some silence and being in nature and having some challenges and getting cross and upset and having to think through things again. Um, and in the past, um, it was a lot of really interesting PhD physics students from Oxbridge or something in some of the early ones who explained to me that perhaps time all happened at once or all sorts of other ideas that I like to play with. Um, but on this particular Northern Cross 2022, um, I actually met a guy and I won't say what NGO he worked for because that would identify him. And one of the important things about any kind of safe space that you create where you're sharing with people is that you don't go out and blow, oh, so-and-so said this. Um, but he, he had been the head of a major NGO in conservation terms working within so he was inside the room in the Paris talks and people like me were outside on the street um, and we had a number of conversations and this idea that that I was working on and that Rupert Reed had really really resonated with him and he had come on the pilgrimage although he he decided that somehow the person of Jesus Christ was something he really had to explore to try and find where he was going. He'd left the major conservation organization he worked for. He was moving into something else. He's, I've, I've looked him up on, on the internet and I'm amazed that I was talking to this guy. Not that I'm worshiping him or anything, but it was just very interesting how, how humble he was and how we chatted. And he was right, he was doing something that actually I wouldn't agree with he was gonna move into next, but that was fine. I don't agree with um, uh, financializing nature and um, trying to use that, things like the various sorts of methods that they're trying to use to use the market system itself in order to try and make things better. But um, yeah, it was very interesting. And it kind of gave me extra courage, I think, to continue with my, my journey. So, so I come to a kind of an interim conclusion, really. Um, which is for me, and I would be very interested to hear what other people think and where they're up to. Um, but I think it's important to face things and be with people that you can be real with. I think compassion is incredibly important, but I think it's going to get very hard with so many people in the global south, in the majority world, who's life is already becoming extremely difficult and the clamoring of refugees at our shores 
and yet being within a country where the government and supposedly the majority of the people want to keep the fortress Europe, but the fortress Britain up to keep ourselves safe from people outside. Um, and act as if it's worth it. So I, I, I think I act as if I believed entirely in the that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, even though I couldn't tell you I believed it. I act as if it, I did, I think is what I do. Um, and act as if it's worth going on an XR event or trying to stop a coal mine or so on. And um, find a way of being joyful, even having looked at all the facts. That's a, a poor quote, not badly quoted from a Wendell Berry poem that I haven't been able to find again, but which um, somebody drew to my attention. So that is my, my contribution. Um, and I will stop sharing and hand it over to discussion, if that's all right. Thank you, Maggie. That's given us an enormous amount to consider and and think about. So, our friends, questions and comment, please. Yeah. I, I I quite agree. It's so important to be joyful. I, I, I'm very fortunate because I look out of my window and above the tops of the houses, what I mainly see is trees. And I know I am very, very lucky to be looking out at trees and not out a grey concrete wall of bats or something. But, but it, that makes it easy for me to be joyful. And um, when I can't see those trees, I can remember them. And I remember the sea as well. That's important to me. I love the sea. And they're, they're true. They, those images do bring joy into my heart. And it does, it does affect how, how I can deal with the rest of my life. Thank you. So thank, you for, for, for that. thank you for your talk as well. I should have said that first. It was really, it was so interesting that I was so yeah. taken with that last screen about the joy. Yeah. Got a hand up from Richard. Richard, do. Do continue. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to um, put, um, I've just put something in chat because um, the, the the matter of what you were talking about, Maggie, was so, it's, it's very um, dear to me. I, I, I fluctuate between not paying attention to these things because it's too difficult and I get cross with people who aren't taking them seriously. Uh, so I, I, I kind of, ignore stuff and and then and then really want to take part in things that I find frustrating and futile uh, and, and don't know what to do. Uh, but the film I put a link to um, a review of is called Once You Know. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't remember quite how I got hold of this link, but one of the various interest groups I'm in sort of shoved it at me and I watched it on um, Vimeo or something. Uh, but it, it, it might be publicly available. It says it's on the streaming services on digital platforms, but it's um, in part, it looks at people who've been in the situation of knowing that climate change is not going to be sorted for years and have been telling people about it for years and have made personal sacrifices like not having children a long time ago because they know uh, it's it's going to be dire but who still have the hope that things can change i found it very moving and the hope that they're talking about is not hope that climate change will be sorted or won't be as bad as everyone fears but that in 
looking at the communities that are dealing already with the effects of climate change on their livelihoods and their social structures, there are communities that are finding ways to be resilient and finding ways to build um, networks of resilience within and with other communities. And, and that is the hope that it offers, that actually we, we can behave differently in our communities, in our societies, uh, to build resilience, to cope with the changes that are going to come. Um, so, yeah, have a, have, a, have a watch of that if you can. I've seen it twice and I cried both times in various places. Can I, can I come back on that? I, I, I've, I will try and find that film. It sounds really interesting. But one of the things um, I, I'm not struggling with, I go backwards and forwards over, is that we often find ourselves hoping in something. So like hoping in resilience, hoping in community. Um, there are some people obviously who, who, who um, hope in some sort of technological fix, you know. And it was quite interesting looking at the biblical references to hope. There was a lot of talk about the wicked having hopes in the wrong things or other people or the foolish having hopes in wrong things and people being misled by hopes in wrong things. And they talked about spiders webs of, of hope, which weren't going to work. I'm not saying the one you're talking about is at all, because that's what I think we do need to do. And that's what Rupert Reed suggests that we do. So that's the sort of adaptation you know growing food together with people nearby us and stuff like that but I think my point is that I think I'm going to a hope even if that doesn't work it was still worth it because something about remaining compassionate and cooperative in a community is sort of what maybe that's what if if God is like that is, is something you can talk about in that way maybe that's what she he they want maybe that's where we're moving and we have to choose between one thing and another and and society will polarize if you like um uh and again that was something they kind of i'd said to the to the uh the researchers for um for uh, uh songs of praise in earlier on and they kind of wanted me to say it again but actually in the middle of the ukraine war i didn't want to start saying this is the crux, you know, we're at the end point of humanity or anything. I just didn't want to say that sort of stuff. But it does seem to me it's the sheep and the goats time. You have to decide which you are. Um, but that's just things that occur to me sometimes. I'll be quiet now. And leave. The, the cynic in me wants to try and remember the quote from Clockwise about um, it, it, it's the hope that really kills you. Yes, but that's what that's what Greta Thunberg says, you see. Greta Thunberg gets really, really angry if people tell her, oh, you should have more hope. And um, there are a lot of people who say that don't tell me to hope because I've got to learn to cope without hope. Um, but it's very much a personal choice, I think. I had the... Uh, I. No, an ideal understanding, whatever, is that we have to go towards the complete economic crash of the capitalist society before we can consider anything from the other side, go, going into the other side. I believe that is possible, but... I believe quite strongly that there are, as the phrase goes, dark times ahead. But there will be a there, there, there will be a dawn. You know, it's um, it's something I I believed in since I was perhaps a young hippie. You know, and uh, and still have shreds of that within this this cynical old frame. Trying to unmute myself. I think that's the butterfly out of the chrysalis. 
Ray, in a way, is it? I think so. Mary. I was wondering um, what kind of responses and attitudes the younger members of the pilgrimages have whether they differ for the up from the middle-aged or olders? Well, that's a very good question, Mary. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, sadly, because um, we haven't, hasn't walked on for two years, and then yeah. this year was a sort of middle COVID and very difficult, we didn't really have any young people with us. There was a, there's a younger generation than me. Um, and because they're actually um, young professionals and they're, embroiled in their workplaces. And um, I think it's it's obviously a luxury to be on a pension and after finished my career and being able to, you know, retire from um, mm. something which might have been harmful and then use all my knowledge there to try and fight climate change, um, so, but, but still get my pension coming in. So to ask people to give up their jobs, I think is very difficult. Um, and because of the way that, uh, and I have to respect that, it's, I didn't walk out of my job. I carried on working until I, until I got my small pension from Cumbria County Council, you know. Um, and uh, so what can we say to them? But they do, they do respect, they do listen, they do, they're totally with me. Um, they see all this stuff that we, as you say, the, the grandparent generation are doing as kind of prophetic. Um, they ask me specifically what's coming next, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of our regular pilgrims is actually a, a, an economist who's quite regularly on the BBC, a woman called Frances Coppola, and she's a, she's a great friend of mine. Um, and uh, so she's she's a bit younger than me, but but um, but we don't have the really young people at the moment um, because you. they don't get the school holidays off anymore. And even the students don't because they're all working. The days of people doing a PhD and having loads of time to do their doctorate and not having to do a job as well. A long gone. It's, um, it's a sad thing. I think it might die, to be honest. I think the pilgrimage will in the end stop. I'm not sure I will ever do it again, to be honest. Not because I can't walk, but because it keeps crashing with Extinction Rebellion weeks. <laughs> <laughs> David. Yeah, I wasn't sure, uh, Maggie, for, for a second there, whether you said, uh, well, young people do say, saying that, that what we were doing was um, prophetic, but I, I heard it as pathetic. And, and no, 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 and, and, uh, and that sounded <laughs> totally appropriate <laughs> because what we're doing just absolutely isn't enough and hasn't been <laughs> enough. Um, and uh, I feel sort of quite kind of bipolar about this because um, I think, you know, the, the acting as if bit is in there, you know, as in, uh, I forget who it was. I, I used to think that it was Meister Eckhart who said, if I knew the world was going to end tomorrow, I'd still want to plant a tree today. And then I discovered that it was actually Martin Luther. And of course, Martin Luther was responsible for the slaughter of about 30% of the European population by, you know, his wonderful reformation, uh, which just brought on incredible religious wars. So, and, and the point is that what, 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 whatever you do may seem like a solution or it may end up being something completely awful. Um, and it, it's so hard for us to know. So, you know, it, it, you know, I, I flip from, oh my God, you know, this definitely is the end times. Things are going to go from bad to worse, and we're not in the worst of it yet. And, uh, you know, I go to meetings with people talking about, oh, you know, sea level rise of 90 millimetres a year. And I think, you don't know the half of it, chum. You know, the, the rate at which global warming is increasing and you're getting 30 degrees at the South Pole. Well, 30 degrees at the South Pole is the melting of three miles of polar ice cap. So the six meters sea level rise just from losing Greenland, but the 70 meters from losing the Antarctic ice cap. Um, and I live, um, you know, if I get my little compass out, I'm 10 meters above sea level where I'm sitting right now. So that's 60 meters under sea level. So, 
you know, I can, I can smile and laugh. And um, because on the one hand, it's, it's just too insane to be able to think about rationally. I love your comment about hearing prophetic as pathetic, because I think you're absolutely right, both are true. Um, I think they, they feel that because I'm repeating to the to this middle age group, um, young, young adults probably in their, I'm calling him young, in their early 40s probably, um, I'm repeating the stuff that we all take as read and we're very much into and we, we hear about and they, they feel that is being prophet prophetic, but I agree with you that everything we do is pathetic, but we still have to do it. <laughs> and, and to be honest, it gives us joy sometimes just working together. So it's just a natural reaction to want to do stuff together and it makes us feel better. So in some senses, I sort of think, well, don't overthink this, Maggie, just get on and, and do what what feels good. It's like the old, it's like the old stuff they used to say. I've got an awful lot of my old Catholic spirituality, which is still sort of bubbling away under the surface. And sometimes it's quite a rich vein. But you know, love God and do what you like. Um, because you'll only like to do things that are of God if you if you if you if you love that. And it's the same, love the earth and do what you like. Um but yes, there are times when it's difficult because what we feel we have to do is sitting at a computer, not out in the garden or going for a bike ride or doing things that we would enjoy more. Hence, the, hence there is the sacrificial element, even though huh, I certainly didn't sacrifice myself or stop having children. I've got five of them, so goodness. Yeah, before we knew. <laughs> if, 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 I, if I can sort of speak again, I mean, I think the joy is easier to... Um, handle than the hope because you can get the joy by looking at small things and doing stuff and and, and I, I have an affinity I have a, an aptitude for that um, it's the hope I struggle with um, but I'm, I'm in my mind because I've been going to a lot of the yearly meeting preparation stuff uh, this week and last night's I found um, quite surprising it was uncomfortable histories now I know the generality of, of what they're talking about and and all these great heroes of Quaker history are faulty people. But I, I hadn't realised the extent, the sheer extent to which people had ignored um, the issues of slavery because it wasn't convenient to hear the truth. I hadn't heard before about the Germantown Declaration uh, in 1688 that was sent up through all the meetings and ignored. Um, from a group of Mennonites who associated themselves with Quakers uh, that, that thought that slavery was appalling and an insult to um, God's intent. And I hadn't really understood uh, that where the history of Quakers um, in, in the very early years was, was people from all walks of life uh, coming together um, that, that very quickly, it seems, uh, we established a, a hierarchy of power where, where poor people were patronised or, or, or even not invited to become members for fear that it would strain the finances of the uh, meeting to look after them. And, you know, you look at that and the, the Cadbury libel uh, that, that, that was <laughs> finished in 1909 where he was accused of hypocrisy and, and sued uh, the press for libel, uh, was, was found cleared, but the jury awarded him a halfpenny damages. And the way that the Church Times came to his defense that this was an insult against a very worthy man who tried very hard over, over nine years to uh, not source his cocoa from slavers in um, Portuguese colonies. Um, and, you're thinking, OK, it's, it's great to hear this now, but but what is it that we're now not listening to? You know, this is where my frustration uh, rises up and, and I can get quite cross because we know we've had the Canterbury commitment. We've had all these things. We've had, um, you know, commitments galore as, as local Quakers and national Quakers. And yet we've still had to go through a uh, quite a lengthy process of persuading people 
um, in one of our local meeting houses, they shouldn't just renew the gas central heating because that was the easy and expedient thing to do. Mm. It's almost impossible to talk openly to people about whether or not they should be uh, flying on holiday or driving cars because uh, that's too provocative. Um, and yet, you know, they did try to exclude people from Quaker communities for owning slaves, but but didn't av av ever have the the courage to do that, even in the days when Quaker had that authority. So um, I, I do wonder with all this stuff, whether we're just being a bit nice with each other and, and we should be a bit more demanding of each other. Uh, and I include myself in that. I mean, I think I'm OK, but, you know, someone should be pointing to, well, why are you still doing that? And, you know, um, I, I don't feel held to account by Quakers for my uh, standing in the world, for my action in the world. Thank you very, very much for sharing that, Richard. I think this is the kind of honesty that we're going to need, isn't it, moving forward? Mm. I mean, the next step of Extinction Rebellion at the moment, Gail Bradbrook and her friends are now taking forward what they call being the change. And I haven't really explored it yet. Um, but be the change was a was a rather awkward movement before, which basically said, you know, you've got to be absolutely pure in yourself. No, pure, no hypocrisy. You must never do this. If you've got a car, how can you say this? And of course, the, the press are absolutely first masters at that, aren't they? You know, there was a poor young woman on talking about something and they started having a go at her. For, well, where do your clothes from come from? She wasn't even talking about the textiles. And, um, you know, what was she supposed to do? Sit there with nothing on, you know? Um, but I think being the change is trying to be a bit different and it's a bit more like the Rupert Reed approach of developing adaptive communities and doing what you can transformationally wise. But he would also like to call people who have jobs into doing a, a one day strike like the school children did. Um, and finding symbolic ways, uh, because a lot of us can't afford to put in hot air source heat pumps and for that instead of the gas boilers. I know I've struggled with that myself. It's not suitable for my house, I don't believe. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we're all being squeezed financially too, or a lot of us are, especially when our children are being squeezed and we have to start sharing our stuff with them. So, it, but I think they're conversations would be really, really good to have. Well, it's 11.59. Um, well, the, um, well. May, I, may I kind of quickly say something which is perking away in my brain here, is that uh, this might be slightly controversial if I say, if I do say I apologise when you feel offended. Uh, there is, there has come a time in the past where the classic of wearing the hair shirt of saying, you know, I am doing this and I am doing that, you know, kind of, uh, and, and I am being an amazingly good person, kind of, what are you doing type of thing, you know, which um, doesn't, doesn't work for me at all, you know, because it's, you know, yeah, well, Good for you. Carry on, mate. <laughs> I'm going to be even naughty and squeezing something else. You also get, and I've met people who do this, a really quite unhealthy um, and and um, obsessive attempt to to do things. And people with mental health difficulties as well can feel. I mean, I know people who, you know, they've they've had their whole gas connected out of their house and sat with no with no heating and sitting sitting shivering. And um, I think it's important that we remain loving and pr pragmatic, isn't it? At the same time as being yeah. honest and challenging. Mm. Right. Any, any more comments, friends? Well, just, just a quickie, and that is that, um, uh, and it's a little bit on the hope side, and it's a little bit on the, on the uh, what are we blind to side because um, uh, I, th I think that, that what's happening in the world at the moment is um, 
the end of not just capitalism, but materialism. Um, and that I, I well, we'll, we'll have the chance to carry on talking about this. I can see Hattie. Uh, <laughs> Hattie. I'm sorry, but I think human beings always want to improve the world. And mostly that involves doing practical things in front of them with objects. Um, uh, I absolutely don't have anything to disagree with there. Um, I, I do think that the materialist mindset, which has us separate from the planet and from each other and from individuals, has done everything to create uh, uh, a, an Im immensely unequal society. There's obviously plenty on our wonderful planet for everyone. Gandhi's quote, you know, there's enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. Uh, and uh, I think the, the making joy peace, even while thinking maybe there is no hope, is about creating community. It's about creating connections. It's about digging deeper. Um, but I, I do think there's 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 a lot of potentially good stuff coming down the pike, and things could turn around really quickly if if we set our minds to it. If we sorry. sorry, Hattie, did you want to say something? What, David? If we set our minds to it. Uh, there's there's a lovely story of um, and, and even while it seems futile, there's there's a story of uh, in India, of um, Indra, the god of the gods, getting angry with the people or getting angry with something, and he causes a, a mighty rain to fall, and the villagers are all really really upset about the rain and they, and they rush to Krishna. And they say, save us, Krishna, can you save us? And he lifts the top off a mountain and holds it as an umbrella over the village, right? And this is clearly something, you know, nobody could lift up a mountain and hold it in the village. And all the little villagers go and get sticks to help hold the mountain up, right? And it's obviously futile and it's beautiful as well because they're, 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 they're you know their god is saving them and and they're doing what they can and you know at the same time as we feel that there isn't anything that we as individuals can be doing we could at least be holding up our sticks and feeling a mm -hmm. sense of community and and aligning with the divine in bringing in whatever it is that's new and meaningful. I think that is what we're doing. I just wanted to say quickly, I found a link which is supposedly enables us to watch once you know, and I've popped it into the chat. Mm -hmm. So if we can, um, if if people can grab that from there uh, before this closes, um, I don't know whether you save the chat uh, or whether you can pick those uh, things out. I saved the chat and I will put the link in the notes for the... Uh, video of this talk when we do it. So mm -hmm. I put notes under the talk, which gives fairly comprehensive links. So you can take the notes and send it to someone and it gives a link to the talk and to anything else that's been talked about. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me so intently and um, bearing with me when you couldn't hear anything. So you saw some pictures, but didn't hear anything and, uh, and, and contributing to the discussions. Lovely. Thank you very much. Lovely, Maggie. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much to everybody. And to next week, as which is quite remarkable, we're having Alan Playdell, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, speaking um, Ukraine slash Russia testing our peace testimony. That's good. <laughs> I will see you then, Prince. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Maggie. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.